Would you stand with me, please? If you would grab your Bible and turn with me to Jonah, chapter 4. And I don't know if this is sacrilegious for me to do this. While you're turning, I'm going to pray. Lord, we thank you for bringing us out, Lord. We thank you for folks like the Morrises that are, well, they're doing what they love. They love the camp life. So, Lord, you got them serving at camp. That's, that's how you work. And, Lord, we do ask and pray that you would provide for their needs, that you'd bless them as they're serving up there, or that you bless and use that camp, Lord. And as we uh, hunker down and look at, some, look at some business this morning, Lord, that you would be with us, that you'd bless us, that you'd speak to our hearts, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jonah chapter 4, verse 10. I'll read it, we'll read it, and then you guys can have a seat. Here it says, But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock? Go ahead and have a seat. When I read that, maybe when you just read that, or you read it in the past, maybe you think of not Assyria. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. But maybe you don't think of Assyria. Maybe you think of America. Because I do. I, I think of a, of a young man who I worked with about a year ago this time. He was a young man, and to put it quite nicely he didn't have a clue and he was the head of a family and I, I, I read this and I think of him because here's this young man and as, as I'm getting older young men are getting older <laughs> so he's a kid at 35 we used to call people like that grown-ups but he's <laughs> leading his family and I just kind of you know he'd tell me you know how things were going in his house and how he ran things and I just think, yikes, because, you know, he's, he's the authority figure, but he doesn't have a clue because he's not listening to the Lord. And I think there's a billion other of this young man out there that are just groping about, that have no clue what's going on, that is just messed up. And this, this was the Lord's heart for Assyria. I believe this is the Lord's heart for America. You know, I, I have a working knowledge of a calendar. That means I look at it. I understand that the numbers correlate with days, and this day means this. Today is the, uh, the 10th, which means tomorrow is the 11th. It's September the 11th. And if you've been around for a while, that was the day that just kind of changed everything. Because we in America, up until that point, we kind of lived in a bubble. We didn't, you know, we didn't have to live the way the rest of the world lived. We didn't, you know, we had little inconveniences, but we pretty much went where we wanted to go. We did what we wanted to do. We were Americans, and we were free, and we were brave. But that day, it changed everything. And there was a brief revival, and, and a lot of us thought, man, the Lord, he just, maybe he just, he used this to, this to, to spark something. And it, it flamed out, and it went away. And people forgot. I mean, there's a new generation. Uh, I've, I've been working with them for the last 10 years. They, don't have, they weren't alive when 9-11 happened. So with these kids, and these are kids, they're like, they, you know, like I would with Pearl Harbor. I wasn't alive when Pearl Harbor uh, occurred, obviously. So it's kind of like, yeah, it was history, and that looks horrible. But eh. And that's the way a lot of people are with 9-11. But it, it, it kind of awakened us. You might say we were woke as a, a, a pun because woke is the new sleep. I mean, not only do you sleep, you're dead asleep. But that's a sermon for another day. But we kind of awakened, but we went right back to sleep. Be, you know, because things happen and you get distracted. And you look at the state of our union now and, oh, man, I mean, this president, that president, any of them. I think I would stand up and applaud if the president went down at the State of Union, not just this one, any of them, and he would just be honest. He would pretend that he saw what the rest of us see, and he would say, I can assure you 
that the state of our union is poor. Oh, if we had a president like that. I mean, everybody would hate him. <laughs> but everybody would say, this guy's telling the truth. And once you start to see the truth, then you start to make necessary changes because of the truth. But if you get up there year after year, term after term, it's great. And it's like, what, what country are you looking at, Charlie? It's not great. It's not strong. It's never been weaker. A nation, I want to lay out a description, and maybe you'll see what I'm talking about. I see a nation that is divided. Ironically, we're the United States, but we're not united. You know, we're divided racially. You know, I remember coming up, and the, the goal was to, to get it together the, the more we progressed. And, I, you know, I think people are more upset about the racial divide now than they were back in the day. And it's like, I thought we were supposed to be progressing, but we're not. Uh, politically, you know, it used to be, you know, they pretended to get along. And now they don't even pretend. I hate him, he hates me, we hate each other, but we all hate y'all. And then, yeah, and <laughs> let's sing God Bless America. And it's like, really, are we gonna sing that? And it's just kind of a, a, a free for all and nobody knows what's going on. You know, you, I look at a nation and we are confused and we are confusing others. You know, I'll be honest, I'm, 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 I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, my, what I'm doing here is what I know what to do, but, uh, life up here, Jay told me it would take me about three years to, to acclimate. And I think he, because Jay is an optimist, so I think he was giving me the Jay McCarl curve. He's like, you 30, but it came out three. So I'm not, a, I'm not a farm person, you know, but, you know, it used to be for me, you know, you, you look at a duck, I can't tell if it's a girl or a boy. Maybe you can. It, to me, it's just a bird. Who thought the day would come where people would be like that with people? I don't know if you're a boy or a girl. What do you think you are? You think you're a boy or a girl? Well, it's Monday, so you're a girl. But tomorrow's Tuesday, so you're going to be a boy. But the track meet's on Saturday, and you'll get back to me. And people are confused, and then people are going out, and they're confusing other people. That's what's going on with our nation. The people are distrustful. People are unsure. We don't trust the politicians, that's nothing new, but now it's like a little bit behind it. You don't trust any of the news outlets because they pretty much tell you what you want to tell, what they want to tell you. A lot of people don't trust the, the medical industry because things have happened, I don't want to get into, but things have happened, unfortunate things have happened, and now people are like, mm, no thank you, I'll, I'll, you know, give me a Band-Aid and some dirt and I will we'll be good, and I, cover up my band-aid right now, but that a lot of people are that way. You know, we're under siege at our border. We're under siege within our borders, at, at one another's throats. And when I read this text, and Lord, the Lord says, there's 120,000 of them. They don't know their right from their left. Bunch of little kids. And this is how cool God is. And they're animals. God cares about the animals. God cares about our one-eyed cat that we brought up with us. And so I'm a softie, so yeah, we have a one-eyed cat, and she sleeps on me, and it's great. But, but God cares about all of it. He says, you cared about this plant, Jonah, but you don't care about these people or their stuff or their kids. And here God is the only book that ends with a question, and God is asking Jonah, the prophet, the preacher, the guy who should get it, he's asking him, shouldn't I care? You care about your stuff, but do you care about these people? There are people that are mixed up. There are people that are confused. And let's not leave out good old wicked, if you would, for your convenience, turn back to Jonah chapter 1. Turn there with confidence, because it comes right before Jonah chapter 2. Um, but I want to show you the Lord's heart for our nation because, you know, I went to Christian college and there was this thing that, oh, that's nationalism. You can't care about America. You can't pray uh, for America. You, you know, we, we should care about the world. Well, yeah, we, we care about the world and we pray for the world. But guess what? America is part of the world. And it's the part of the world that we currently live in. So I'm kind of invested in America doing well. I cannot go back to Wakanda, mainly because 
some unfortunate things happened the last time I was there. Just kidding. Wakanda doesn't exist. Just in case you're wondering, it's like I knew Jeremy was Wakandan. I could tell. No, there's, there's no such place. That's why I'm not going there. My whole point is, I live here. This is my home. I, I care about America. If I don't have anywhere else I can move to. So I'm all in. So, so when people say, oh, you know, you're, you're, you're not praying God's will, you're not, you don't have the right mindset, they're out to lunch. Because you can love your, your country and pray for the Philippines. I do. You can love America and pray for Peru. We do. Uh, it, it's not an either or. It's a both. And, and so when people say this, they, they just don't get it. But I want to show you the Lord's heart because he kind of shows his heart. But let's look at the beginning. It says, now... The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Some, they had a snitch. There was someone in Nineveh that was praying and that was telling the Lord, this is what the Ninevites are doing, and I don't like it. So somehow the Lord heard what was going on. I mean, he's God, so you know what I'm talking about. But Jonah, he arose to flee to Tarshish. I don't know who said it. Maybe it's me. I'm going to steal it. I said it. God said, go. Jonah said, no. <laughs> and we do it, we kind of make it seem like, oh, we're, we're the soft touch and God's mean. I care about this person, but God doesn't care about those people. I mean, if you watch the news and the Christian is represented, no one loves the LBG etc. People. Nobody loves these people. God, the Christians, they're, they're all, no, we're the ones that love them. It's, uh, you know, the people that are trying to placate them that don't care. And here you see God's heart. God says, hey, do, don't you care at the end to Jonah? After Jonah reluctantly went and ushered in the greatest revival in the history of the world and was mad about it. Uh, but here God says, go. He says, no. And he goes straight the other way. And who's the initiator? Who's the one starting? Who's, I mean, it's always vulnerable when you meet somebody, especially because I just, I don't know what to do when I meet people. So you, do you stick out your hand or, or you hug or do you, do you do this? I mean, I have no clue. So if I've done that little dance with you, I apologize. I just, I just, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'm supposed to dance like kid and play or I just. But God does that. God is the one reaching out each and every time to sin for humanity, who has thumbed its nose reluctantly, uh, not reluctantly, but blatantly at him over and over, and God continues to reach out. He continues to take that first step. First steps are tough because you put yourself out there. And someone, they may reach out. They may just look at you like, what's that there for? And I've had that happen. You feel kind of stupid, but you just shrug your shoulder, hmm, and you move on. And unfortunately, the Lord has had to do that a lot. But you look at these folks, and you know I'll call them the Assyrians. But in my notes, I have it under parentheses, the wicked. Because God cares about the Assyrians, or for lack of a better term, the wicked. Let me get you ready for lunch, and let me tell you how wicked they were. This is why Jonah, when God said go, he's like, nah. Because the Assyrians, they would come in to, to your town, and they would slice open the pregnant women so that they could see their babies drop to the ground. And that was the last sight they saw. That's how brutal these guys were. They come in, they decapitate people, and they make little pyramids of their skulls so that everybody that walked by said, oh, this, the Assyrians were here. They would make their furniture upholstered out of the skin of the people they conquered. That's, that's who the Assyrians were. So when God said, hey, go to the Assyrians, Jonah, he's like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> that's like if Jeremy's like, uh, if Jeremy, if the Lord was like, hey, there's a, there's a neo-Nazi rally down the street, Jeremy, I want you to go and preach. Nah, God... I'm good. <laughs> Jay is getting back from Israel in about doesn't matter, but he's coming back eventually. People still going to be racist. It sounds like a, a job for Jay. I mean, and that's, that's the, uh, my secondary title, a job for Jay. Uh, and that would have been the same thing in that, in that day and age for, for God to say, go to this year. That would have been the exact same thing. And he's like, Lord, are you crazy? Uh, this, this may not go so well for me because Jonah didn't, he didn't look back and say, oh, well, three chapters from now, I'm going to go. I'm going to give the most half-hearted message in the history of the world. 
And everybody's going to get saved. Like everybody, even their donkeys are going to get saved. He didn't see that. But even when it happened, he still didn't care because he still hated these people. They, they hated him. I mean, it was two-sided racism that was going on here. But you know what? You know who did not care? God didn't care. And this is something that people don't realize. God died for. God reaches out to. God loves people that are messed up. People that are, you know, I, I have a hard time around racist people because they tend not to like me. I like to be liked. But, you know, but God, he says, you know what, I die for them. And he died for the criminals. And he died for the alphabet soup group. And he died for those people that want to get him kicked out of every federal building on the planet. He died for all. The, that's his heart. Uh, dying, loving, reaching out for the wicked. For your convenience, Genesis you can turn there like a champ. If you end up in the table of contents, you went too far. <laughs> so then just go a little, just correct your course, go a, bit, a little bit this way, and you'll be good. But here, I want to look at another group of people because you see that God's heart has not changed. The people have changed outwardly, inwardly, Sin is still sin, death is still death, but the outer, because we get hung up on what the sin looks like, not that it's just sin. I mean, a guy can be just as lascivious as he wants, but if he's heterosexual, we're kind of like, eh. But if someone is, you know, waving a rainbow flag and they're quite homosexual, then we're like, oh my gosh. And it's the same thing in God's eyes. Sin is sin. The same sin, uh, uh, you know, if it's an ugly sin that we think, or an acceptable sin that we think either which one will drag you straight to the pit of hell. And that's, that's what God, he says, I'm not worried about how ugly it looks or how it makes you feel uncomfortable. My concern is that it is sin and it does lead people to death. So I'm not concerned about the trappings or that it makes you uncomfortable. I'm concerned about the sin. And we hop to another group, another sin, and, uh, but the same heart, the same uh feeling from God, Genesis chapter 18, verse 16. And here it says, Then the men, the angels that had visited with uh, Abraham, they rose from there and they looked towards Sodom. What? Is this is one of those Sundays? Yep, it is. Uh, and Abraham, he went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? The Lord's asking a question, but he's not asking a question. Because it's implied, Nah, I ain't hiding nothing. And so, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I have known, um, I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken. That is like the longest run-on sentence question in the world. And he still didn't answer the question. And the Lord said, because... The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave. And it says, he still hasn't said, you know, what the title of his message here is, but he says, hey, should I tell Abraham what I got cooking? You know, because Abraham this and Abraham that, and because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is very great. Somebody, there was a snitch in Sodom and Gomorrah. More than likely, it was Lot. It was one person who cared enough who was, it says in Hebrews, he was vexed day in and day out by what he saw, by what he heard. Can you relate? And so, and Lot was no, he, you know, he was not like, you know, the, he was not going to be hosting promise keepers. I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself there because, but until they come up with something, something new, maybe still promise keepers or promise keepers again, uh, I'll stick with that. He was like, lukewarm, backslidden, but he knew right and he knew wrong and he knew these cats were not doing it. And I think personally that that was the outcry that God heard. That was just one person who wasn't even really on the book. He said, Lord, this is, this junk is getting out of hand. And God listened because it was, because God was just waiting for someone to say, help, send help, do something. And Lot did. And it started the wheels uh, Roland, he says, I will go down now and see 
whether they have done all together according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And, and if not, I will know. So, hey, someone's been praying. Someone's been saying this is what they're doing in San Francisco. I mean, Sodom. This is what's going on. And, and it's, you know, kids are getting hurt and people are getting destroyed and, and people are celebrating and marching about it. And, but there's one person that is, is just up in arms and on their knees about it. So I'm going to go down there and see, you know, is, is the story true? Now, obviously, the Lord did not make, need to make the trip down to Sodom. But he's painting a picture for Abraham. He's painting a picture for us. And so then the men, they turned away from there, and they went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood still before the Lord. He, they were walking together, but then Abraham, he kind of stopped. And Abraham came near and said, Lord, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? This is one of the, I mean, there's, I love the Bible. And there's so many cool stories in it, just because people being people and folks being folks. Abraham is a barterer. He's a bargainer. He's going to dicker with God. He's, to the naked eye, he's going to lowball God. Um, it, like, this is like the closest thing that you have to a used car salesman in the Bible. And Abraham is selling God a limit. God, the tires on this thing, they're great. He kicks it. Psst. Don't, that just means it's broken in, Lord. It'll give you about 15,000 more miles. And a lot of times, you know, the Lord just kind of bears with us and we think, got him again. And the Lord's like, no, you didn't get me. I'm just, I want to do what you're asking me to do. I'm just kind of bearing with you because you're a clown and I love clowns. And, you know, and that's the next group that I'm going to look at. But he starts to dicker with God and he says, I love supposes. Have you ever had someone like, suppose, I, used to, I taught high school for two years, and there's all, I mean, there were supposes in every class. Suppose this, Mr. Grant, suppose that. I was like, if I ever find one of these supposes, I'm going to shoot it and then run it over with my car. Because like, you get sick of supposes. But he says, suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you destroy the place and not spare it for the, the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it that you should do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Lord, there should be a difference. Far be it from you. Uh, shall, uh, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place for the 50. And then Abraham said, indeed, now I am but dust and ashes. I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose, Jeremy's favorite word, there were five less than the 50 righteous. Would you destroy all the city for a lack of five? I mean, Lord, we were at 50, now we're at 45. I mean, it's only five people. So, I mean, it's, if it was just minus five, would you destroy them over just five? Just un poquito cinco? Just a little five, would you still? And the Lord says, you know, I'm a, right, I'm a righteous God. I'm a reasonable God. So he says, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again. He says, suppose there should be 40 found there. And so he said, I will not do it for the sake of the 40. I'm going to read a little bit quicker because you get where I'm going. And then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. And so he says, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And so he said, indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose... Now the increments are getting bigger. He's like, suppose there'd be five. Now he's just jumping tens. He's like, Lord, if I do this five step, we'll come here all day. So he says, suppose there's 20 there. So he says, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 20. And then he said, let not the Lord be angry. Lord, okay. He's like, he's like a preacher. Lord, I'm almost done. Famous last words. You thought it was just Jay who did that? Nope. That's all of us. He says, Lord, I'm almost done. Don't be angry. I will speak once more. Suppose there should be 10 found there. And he says, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with, with Abraham because he knew Abraham was going to get him down to three. Just kidding. And Abraham returned to his place. And see, here the Lord, he starts, he is the uh, initiator, not with Sodom, but with Abraham. And then he plants this desire, this burden in Abraham's heart. Abraham starts interceding for Sodom. Lord, would you save him? 
Lord, would you save them? Lord, would you spare them? Lord, if it's this many, if it's this many, if it's this many, if it's that many, would you say? And that's, you know, you wonder why you care about fill in the blank because the Lord has put that in your heart, that you care about those people, that region, that city, that group, that whatever, that's there. God has planted that seed so that you will intercede, so that you will care, so that you will pray. It's like A.W. Tozer said, God is waiting to be invited to interrupt the flow of human events. Because God sees that, I mean, we are running the car off the cliff. And God is waiting for someone to say, take the wheel. You come in the other car and wedge me up against the, you know, the, the embankment so I don't kill myself. God is waiting to, uh, to be invited to, to come in and save us. So that's why, you know, you, you, you have this heart for, for them, for those for that, for whatever, and other people don't seem to, to have it. And it's not so that you look down your nose at other people or the whole, if you were a Christian like me, we'd all be out there. No, you're Abraham in that particular uh, vignette, in that sphere of influence. That's the burden God has given you. That's the burden God has given me so that we can intercede. Because that's all Abraham really does, is he intercedes. But once again, you've got this group, the Sodomites and the Gomorans, the, the San Franciscans and Berkeleyans, as I like to call them. I would call these people, for lack of a better term, because we don't, we don't want to judge people by their geographical location. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't know if you guys know me well enough, but I don't care. Um, but we could call, you know, the, the Sodomites and the Gomorans, in parentheses, the perverse. But guess who's reaching out to the perverse? to the perverts goddess. A lot of times we as Christians, we, uh, we, don't, we don't touch them. We just want to pretend they, do, they don't exist. We just close our eyes to it. And God says, I love those people. I die for those people. Somebody needs to pray for those people. Somebody may actually need to get up and go to those people. But that's God's heart. You know, you read the Bible, and then you watch the news, or you watch all these TV shows, somebody's lying. Because you watch TV, and God is this mean, vengeful God who's just up there just sharpening up lightning bolts and just looking for people to, to zap and aim it at. But you read the Bible, and God is saying, I want to put these away. I don't want to use these. But people need to wake up. And he wants to use us. Like I said, somebody's lying. I don't think it's the Lord. In fact, I know the Lord is the one telling the truth. We're going this way. For your convenience and my convenience. Exodus chapter 3. There was another group that it seems that they didn't rank too highly with the people that ruled over them. Can you relate? I know you can't because we live in America. In California. But these folks were, I would call them the oppressed. And God's got a heart for the oppressed. Exodus 3, verses 1 through 10. I tell you that so that you know when I get to 10, you're like, we made it. It says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, Uncle Jed's nephew, just kidding, uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush does not turn. I personally think, this is a Jeremy Grant Commentary means nothing. It's just the way my mind works. Moses had been out there for 40 years just hanging out with sheep. So he's talking to himself. He doesn't say he talked to himself. He says, I will turn and see why this bush is not burning. Because, <laughs> I, you know, I've worked by myself. And after a while, you just start talking to yourself. And when it gets interesting is when you start to answer yourself. And so, but praise the Lord, he doesn't answer himself. So he's, he's not far gone, not too far gone. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush saying, Moses, Moses. God spoke when he saw that Moses cared. There was this little flicker 
There was this thing that didn't look quite right. It wasn't natural that was going on. And once Moses said, you know, that's, I've got to see what's up with that. Once God saw that he had his attention and he cared, God says, all right, I got your attention. I can talk to you now. And so he said, here I am. And then he said, draw near to this place, or excuse me, do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. And moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to a land that is good. And it's a large land uh, to a land flowing with milk and honey to the land of the Canaanites. Oh, yeah, I'm going to read them. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites and my favorites, the termites. <laughs> now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come up to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress me. Now, now come, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. You've got a third group, the oppressed. They're just trying to go to work every day. They went as visitors, but they woke up and they were slaves. They're free labor. They're the working class. Anything you see being produced or built, it's these people that are doing it. But that's not good enough. Now they are told to kill their babies. Now they are told to ignore the plight that's going on. And a, a group that went down that was 70 that were just looking for greener pastures, now they woke up and they are enslaved. And God is letting it happen because God wants them to care. If God just reaches down and drags us somewhere, that's exactly how we see it. I was happy where I was. I was comfortable doing what I was doing. What, because I mean, all you see is the hiccups and the flat tires and all the bad stuff. And we whine the whole way if, it's, if we just think it's God's idea. But if God shows us this is where you are and it's not that great, and you're like, Lord, will you come and help me? You're still going to whine about the flat tires and the potholes and the hiccups and all this stuff, but not as much. Yep, it happens, but we're on the road to somewhere else. And here these people were oppressed by their taskmasters. You might call them the ruling class, just for lack of a better term. And they didn't lead a revolt. God didn't say, I see you sharpening your, your, your swords. I see you putting down your, your spades and you're going to use them as knives. He says, I've heard your cry. I've seen your oppression. What do all of these groups have in common. They all prayed. They all prayed. God had a heart for each and every one of these. I look at these, and this is America. We are wicked. I mean, we are. Maybe not in this room right now, but we've all been done, seen, heard, partaken of evil stuff. So we're kind of in that group. Perverted. It just means twisted. We're a whole lot more twisted than we were when we came out the womb. So we're in that group. A lot of us will say, boy, if, if they, and I'm not going to say who they are because uh, I don't want to have an accident on the way home. But, man, I just wish they would just let me go to work and leave me alone. I, I, do, I mean, how many just, you just want to go to work and just take care of your family and just want to be left alone? Come to church, praise the Lord, watch Jeremy make a fool of himself and just go home. I do. I mean, I don't want to watch Jeremy make a fool of himself. I can see that every day. But just, just want to live a quiet life. A lot of us are in that group. And, you, man, what are we supposed to do? What these people did, they prayed. And see, our problem is that we're Americans. We don't need to pray. We can do it ourselves. July 4th, 1776. We're not taking that off nobody. We'll get a musket and a uh, a rock, and we'll do it ourselves. I don't, I don't think they talk like that. That's just the accent I adopted for that. But the one thing that those folks had, they knew that they were incredibly outgunned and outnumbered, and just they were going to be outdone, but they said, who cares? And they said, well, let's, let's see if the Lord will help us out. And he showed up. 
And they made a de declaration of independence from people, from other nations. But what's implied is they also declared their dependence upon God. And that's, that's what started this whole crazy thing called America going, is people crying out to the Lord, seeking him for the help. One more story that's really one and a half more stories, Second Kings. And we will kind of maybe, don't quote me on it, wrap it up. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. But, you know, our country is in a bad way. I mean, it's funny because if you, whatever news outlet you watch, if you're a, a CNN person or a Fox News person, if you're an MSNBC person or a Newsmax person, it's funny because we're all united. Nobody likes what's going on in the country. If you're a Democrat, you don't like it. If you're a Republican, you don't like it. If you're an independent, you're mad. If you're a libertarian, you're libertarianly upset. And, and then everybody is just, I mean, if you're black, you're mad. If you're white, you're mad. Everybody is mad. Everybody is, is, is I mean, it's just a huge mess. So what do you do? I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not running for governor, I don't think. <laughs> Boy, wouldn't that be something? <laughs> uh, just, Every, every news conference would be no comment. But, <laughs> but what can you do? Because, I mean, you, you, we're only people. What can we do? And this guy, 2 Kings chapter 6, he was just a bald-headed country preacher. There's an anointing that comes with the shine head, I think. But he was just, he was up there in the northern country, had a little school of ministry going on. And it, it's funny because you read through this, and I mean, I'm, I'm the new kid. I'm kind of like Alice. Uh, well, I'm not a new girl in town, but you know what I mean. I'm the new kid on the block. And I'm re you read through this, and it's kind of like, um, like having a small church. We were cutting down trees, and we lost the ax. We were going to eat food, but we tried to eat it, and it was nasty. What are we going to do, Elisha? And he comes along, and he sprinkles some dirt in the stew, and it tastes good. He throws a stick in the water. The axe head floats up. That's not supposed to happen, by the way. Like, all these miracles happen. But he was just a simple country preacher. And kings were out to get him. Armies stopped before the preacher. They didn't march out an army. The bald-headed preacher came out. And miracles were done. The description is, hey, there's no prophet in Israel like Elisha. He was the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. In other words, he was Elijah's assistant. And he says, the word of the Lord is in him. That was the description that they said. Of, he wasn't a statesman. He wasn't a warrior. He was just a preacher that stayed on message. And I want to read you a story. The last story, maybe, about how God can use someone who the world really is not all that scared of. Someone seemingly insignificant, like me. It says, verse 8 of chapter 6, 2 Kings, it says, Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Elisha, God would tell him, This is what the Syrians are doing. And then Elisha would go and tell the king of Israel, don't go that way. It's a trap, like Admiral Akbar. I'm just saying. Um, little Star Wars there. Couldn't help it. Couldn't be helped. Um, and talking about stars again. But he's just a simple preacher, and God is using him as the first line of defense against this king. And by the way, because a lot of people say, well, you can't, you can't get this dogmatic. You can't get this passionate about praying for America because we kill so-and-so how many kids a day? We're doing this. We're doing that. You know, all the filth that goes out to the world comes from America. Israel was doing the exact same thing. But there was a prophet that was interceding on their behalf. God was listening. God was moving. God was helping them out. And I think we can, we can kind of get grandfathered in on that plan. Lord, we're, we're stupid too. Help us. Help us, because we're, I mean, we're clueless just like them, and we admit it, so help. But anyway, so it says, Then the king of Israel, he sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him, and thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. So this, this happened a couple times. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants, and he said to them, Will you not show me which one of us is for the king of Israel? He thought he had a rat. He thought he had a spy, because... 
Israel was always just one step ahead. There was a leak. And one of his servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet, who is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. The enemy was more afraid of the preacher than he was of the king and the army. And I don't think things have changed. Hey, Jeremy can go to work breathing on people, schlepping cheap furniture, because that's essential. But you Christians better stay home because you're not essential. Oh, you can come, but you keep your mask on. Don't sing because that's not essential. And I'm not trying to divide. I'm just saying what I'm just quoting what people said. Cheap furniture was important. But the church being the church and doing church stuff wasn't. They knew who the danger was. They knew that it's not about just coming out and listening to, to some weird guy named Jeremy talk. They knew, man, the God they serve, if they ask him for help, he'll act. We got them, but we can't get him. Let's disconnect these people. And some people, when we got, we got clever with it, praise the Lord, because we got on these computers. And we were poo poo, and it was, it was like Brady Bunch Church. Because you had all these squares, and people were looking up, people were looking down, people were looking over there, and there. It was the Calvary Bunch, the Calvary Bunch. I'm not going to sing it. That's how they became the Calvary Bunch. Because it was going to be in my head all day if I didn't finish it. And Jeremy, as Alice, just kidding. Um, and, and some people just said, heck no, we won't go to the computer. And they went anyway. And God showed up, and, and just. Simple Elisha stuff, but I'm getting, I'm going off on a tangent because the real cool part comes up. And so he said, go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And he wasn't going to give him candy either. And he says, so it was told him, he says, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and they surrounded the city. And when the servants of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounded the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, alas, my master, what shall we, we do? In other words, we're toast. We're in big old trouble. So he answered, he says, do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And what does Elisha do? He stages a sit-in. He goes and he starts a protest. Now, Elisha prayed. And he said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw and he beheld the mountains. The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What was terrifying this guy? He looked up and he saw horses and chariots. Oh, man, there's horses and chariots. And he says, hey, like that old dude from Airplane, hang tight, blood. Actually, that was Mrs. Cleaver. Hang tight, blood. The lady's going to hit you on the flip side with the matter side. Look it up. It's one of the best. But that's what he says. Hey, chill out. The Lord opened up his eyes. And he just saw regular horses and chariots, and he was, he was scared. And the Lord pulled the, the, the wool from over his eyes, and he says, holy smokes. Now, that's an army. And all of a sudden, he wasn't scared about the regular horses and chariots. He said, man, God's got fiery horses and fiery chariots that I do not want to ride. But it's cool. I'll just look at them. And he looked. Elisha got it. But now his servant got it. We're outnumbered. They got more money than us. We can't win. And the Lord, he says, open your eyes. Look to the mountains. There's more with you than are with them. I have a friend, he was in the army, and he, um, he wanted to get into psych ops, and that's when you... You, you go and you mess with the enemy and tell them nobody cares, no one is supporting the war effort. They, you just, you, you break down their spirit by getting in their head. So, you know, we talk a lot because I'm kind of demented. So I was like, well, that sounds interesting. And you look at things and you're like, wow, that's sure what the devil's doing to us. I mean, he's using human instruments, but that's what he's doing. And so we Christians, we start to think, well, let's just, let's just, if you can't, can't beat them, join them. How many Christians have done that? We can't beat them. 
They're, they're regular, we're weird. Let's just roll over and go along with it. And the Lord says, mm -mm. open your eyes. Look up. I'm going to finish the story. I had a couple more scriptures. I'm not going to do I'm just going to finish this one. And we're done because I think it's going to be enough. And you're like, amen. Um, so, okay, so then, uh, so when the, the Syrians came down to him, Elisha, he prayed to the Lord. And he said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them. The Lord struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. You guys are lost. That's why I hate being lost. Because, I mean, you, you can be a, a funny story for anybody. Hey, do you know where such and such is? Yep, that away. And then you drive away and you see them laughing because you... They don't know where they sent you, but it's not the right place. So that's what Elisha says. Mm -mm, this isn't Dothan. You're, no, this is Gotham. Totally different. You, you go that way. Or in fact, listen to my voice. I'll lead you. So he led them to Samaria. And so it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, open up the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and there they were inside Samaria. And now when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he said, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those uh, whom you have taken captive with the sword and with your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So then they prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away. They went to their master, and so the bands of the Syrian raiders came no more to the land of Israel. And I'm going to wrap it up. Give me 10 minutes. Click. I'm going right now. It's so cool, but yet it's so sad because it is our greatest weapon just to ask the Lord for help. And yet Christians, we look at it as the quintessential cop-out. If you don't want to do something, well, I'll pray about it. Oh, yeah, that's been around a long time. I've done that so many times. Oh, you want me to come and do something that I don't want to do on some time where I don't want to do it for free? And now in your mind, you're thinking, I don't want to do that. No, but that doesn't sound Christian. I mean, that just sounds horrible. So what do you, you put a little sugar on it. I'll pray about it. Lord willing, I'll pray about it. And so that's kind of what prayer becomes. But that's not what it is. You need help. You need someone stronger than you. Prayer is great. If I'm walking down the street with my girls and, you know, I got tweaks, so I, you know, I, I, I observe what's going on. So if I see someone that I think is kind of sketchy, I say, get on my left side because my right hand is my strong hand because I want to bless people. <laughs> and, and, and so, but with my girls, if, if, if there's trouble, you know, they, they don't have to give some big, eloquent oration. Our Father, who hails from Vallejo, would you unleash the power and the glory, because that's what I call them, on this bad guy who is threatening our life? They don't have to say all that. All they got to do is say, help. And it's on. And so with prayer... It's not that it has to be this long thing. It is, it's not that it has to be this arduous thing, this big laborious thing. Lord, help. Lord, you see what's going on. Help. You unleash the real power, the real glory. You do it, Lord, because I can't. We tried it, and we have failed miserably. Lord, would you show up, and would you do it? And that's, and, and that's the whole thing. That's the whole, the whole uh, the, the, the moral of the story. Pray. I mean, our country's in a world of hurt. How, what would we do? What would you do for someone who's sick and you're not a doctor, you can't do anything, what would you do? You'd pray, because that's all you could do. You even, in, and I've been there when the doctor says, well, all we can do is hope for the best. When a doctor says that, you know it's bad. And so it's that bad. So what do we do? Lord, you can fix it. The problem is so big. It is so deep. It is so complicated that there's no one party that can fix it. There's no one man that can fix it. It's so bad. The only one who can fix it is the one who allowed it to be formed. And that's you. And Lord, we ask and pray that you would help us. Do we deserve God's help as a nation? We do not. 
Have we earned it? Have we been faithful to God? We have not. But neither have, were any of these people. But God had a heart for these people. And yet he was waiting. And, 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 and people say, well, you know, Jeremy, we, we've had prayer meetings and we've had 40 days of praying and 40 days. And, I'm, and that's all cool. You know, I'm all for prayer meetings. Come out to the church. We want to pray. That's cool. But when Paul says pray without ceasing in the New Testament, the word that he uses for pray, or without ceasing rather, is the same way if you get a tickle in your throat and you're, <clears throat> it's usually when it's quiet, you know, your throat is fine when everybody's talking. But as soon as it gets quiet, then you're, <clears throat> And every time it tickles, you got to cough. And the Lord says, every time it tickles, you cough. Every time you see it, you're watching the news, you pray. Every time you see some nonsense down your street, you pray. Every time whatever triggers you, you pray. And it doesn't have to be some long prayer, just Lord, you see what's going on. Would you help us? Lord, would you touch this country? Lord, would you do this? I mean, I can think of no better way to end this than a typical Jeremy Grant way. It's a because we were talking about cereal, real spiritual stuff at the at the men's meeting, and the guys I were talking about, we like sugar cereal, the, sh the cereal that your parents didn't want to give you. So you know, like it's yabba dabba delicious and it's great for us their flakes. You know, you try to get up here and not make a fool of yourself, just do it. Um, but, you know, we're talking about that, and it's simple. You just sit up there eating your Frosted Flakes, and, you know, Lord, America is not great like it used to be. Would you help us? Or, you know, I see what they're trying to feed our kids as they go to school, and it is not yabba dabba delicious. Lord, would you help the kids? Would you protect the kids? I mean, something as, cereal, uh, as uh, simple as cereal, it's easier to do it than say it, just, you know, all these little reminders that God has our way. Just saying, I want to help you. I want to help. I'm, I'm, you know, he's like that guy. Put me in, coach. Put me in. I want to play. I want to play. And the Lord's like, put me in. Just ask. Just ask. I'm, you know, I'm, I want to do some stuff. I want to do some stuff. The Lord's saying, ask. I, I, want, I want to. And the question is, well, what if we pray? What if we pray and what if the Lord doesn't answer? That's sort of a question. Because there's an eight-day old baby that more than likely will not see it tonight. Because we've been taught, if you don't want a kid, you shouldn't have to have a kid. I'm not going to run down to Planned Parenthood and yell at some lady. But I can pray that God changes her heart. And he very well may. Or she may be hard-hearted. There's an eight-year-old kid at any elementary school in the country that he can't even have a bad day without someone saying, well, maybe you're really a girl. Or maybe you're, what your problem is, is you think you're a boy, but you're really a girl. We gotta pray for these kids. I mean, there's, there's towns. Oakland, Chicago, I mean, Chicago's a war zone. I'm not going to Chicago, I hope, Lord. I hope, I mean, we'll be talking about Jonah, I hope. Uh, I like it here. But Chicago is a war zone. What am I going to go? Strike them blind. I don't know, but I can say, Lord, would you, would you spark something in Chicago? Would you do something good in Chicago? Uh, I mean, D.L. Moody, he was started in Chicago. Would you do, you know, I can't go over, we can't do everything, but man, we can sure ask God to help. And see, the question isn't, what if God doesn't answer? Here's the question. What happens if we don't ask? That's that's the important question, because the answer is, you have not because you ask not. The answer is, let's pray, and let's pray a lot, and let's pray often, just as you would clear your throat. <clears> throat> well, let's pray. I'm serious. Let's, let's, let's stand and let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we don't 
No, seriously, let's stand. Let's pray. Let's, we're, we're gonna we're gonna close it up. <laughs> Good thing I prayed with my eyes open. I was... <laughs> well, that would have that would have been a good blooper reel for the YouTube channel right there. Full preacher praise while anyway. Let's pray so I can get off the stage and shut my mouth. Lord, we don't we don't deserve your help, Lord. We don't. We don't deserve you to interrupt a course that we have painstakingly carved out for ourselves. But Lord, you want to help. You are willing to help. Lord, you can help. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, you would intervene in our nation, in our state, Lord, in our, in our little neck of the woods up here. Lord, that you would save America by saving Americans. Lord, we, we ask for your help. We ask for your grace. We ask for your revival. We just ask for your blessing. We don't deserve any of those. But Lord, we sure do ask. So Lord, we can't. You can. And we just ask and pray that you would. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>